I was trying to come up with a pun about agnostics, but uh, I don't know enough about them. One of the, the main issues that I see crop up in debates around different forms of theism and atheism is the question of knowledge, specifically referencing this as an absolute certainty, and how one can hold a position without knowing one way or another whether or not they're right. And this extends even beyond this particular subject and into several other realms. There's all kinds of different standards that people use for understanding whether or not one holds knowledge. Some people appeal to science, some to their sacred texts or articles of some sort, others to their experience or perspective, some to reason and rationality. And most people have combinations of these things in their life. They'll see an experiment, they'll trust the experiment, they'll read a source, they'll trust the source, they'll have a set of experiences, and they'll trust those experiences. And there's, there's good reasons for doing any of these things. There's also bad reasons for doing any of these things. And something can be false despite good reasons or true despite bad reasons. Perhaps the experiment was done dishonestly. Perhaps the source being read is biased, poorly researched, even malicious. And perhaps the experience is an incomplete perspective or even a mistaken understanding entirely. And sometimes uh, something can just be right accidentally, stumbling uninvited into truth. These are all challenges that are put before us before we take a position on something. Maybe it's on something casual, maybe it's something deeply personal, and sometimes that position needs to be challenged, and we need to think about why exactly we're holding the position that we do. I'd advise anybody who's interested in spirituality to also get into epistemology, that is, the study of how we know things. And that's advocating for spirituality or against it, honestly. It's a fascinating subject. And I got into it through a history of doing debates, such that I got on a number of debate shows. So having a familiarity with it was essential for those conversations. And digging into it, I had to get familiar with common strategies among atheists, as they are very present in the debate scene. So one of those strategies is trying to hang their hat on the uncertainty around epistemic challenges to theism. And usually this is done through using science or empiricism as a determiner of truth, which is a very incomplete way of looking at epistemology because this inherently dismisses much of what we engage with as humans. And yet it's an often repeated position that if something is not empirically verified, that it's not acceptable to believe. When in reality, empiricism increases likelihood, but it's not required for a rational belief, nor is something that is true necessarily going to be empirically verifiable. Now, this can be a paradigm-shifting realization for anybody who holds a standard of knowledge along the lines of scientific standards. Something verified can still be false, as we've seen a number of times throughout our history, and even the brief history of scientific study. And this means that we can empirically know something to be true and later find out that it's, it's false. New evidence will be revealed, and it changes what we thought we knew even if we came to the former conclusion through a process of empirical verification. And it gets, it gets worse, honestly. There's many observations that we hold dear that scientific examination just doesn't apply, as they are impossible to verify, and yet they can still be studied. And this includes things like logical analysis, aesthetic rules, historical events, moral examinations. For example, the laws of logic and mathematical truths on which science is based cannot be verified by science without fallacious question begging. And this is considered spicy in some circles, but this is part of the reason why science and theology are both considered subsets of philosophy, because we check both of them with philosophical values like logic. Sometimes science can be helpful when discussing these broad philosophical questions, especially if an aspect of the question falls within the realm of something like physical science. And sometimes the social sciences can be helpful in these questions. But often these sciences get dismissed by people who hold a stronger favor toward, we'll say hard sciences, to the extent of even applying them outside of their realm. Evidence that should be acceptable in a historical or a sociological conversation are often readily dismissed by those who favor the hard sciences despite their justified relevancy. 
This is often a thing among atheists, and I see this fairly regularly in conversations about history, particularly where the Bible is a valid source for discussion. Nuance gets abandoned fairly quickly sometimes with that one. It also happens in conversations about gender when valid sociological studies are dismissed out of hand. Now, it's often because people don't know any better, but that doesn't change the frustration. An important caveat, however, is this should not be used as some opportunity to leap upon bad science or conspiratorial thinking. Just because the epistemic challenges that I mentioned earlier exist does not mean, therefore, that pseudoscience is acceptable. It's not. And in fact, it's even worse because it's just less supported. One of my major issues with some popular forms of paganism is what I'll sometimes call fluffy bunny approaches to belief. And I think this is everywhere, not one particular grouping. And this is the approach of promoting superstition, that is, harmful practices, bigotry, pseudoscience, or pseudohistory, things, uh, things that fall into that category. And not only is this approach harmful to those who get sucked into it, but it's harmful to the overall credibility of pagans as we get associated with, um, with this crap. Take, um, take folkism, for example. They often accept or dismiss historical facts on the basis of whether or not they like them. If something makes them angry, then it's not true. And this will make their bigotry become their standard for truth. And they'll embrace pseudoscience ideas like McNallan's metagenetics, which is a poor attempt to play racism of the gaps in order to feel comfortable with themselves. That's some fluffy bunnery right there. That being said, uh, I've had a few conversations with polytheists discussing spirituality and its odd relationship with epistemology. And often there's been this point that they believe in the gods, but they don't know that they exist. And they find this bothersome. And they don't want to get the fluffy bunny label or even provide excuses or opportunities for them by accident. And I went through a similar experience. I felt that there was a need to be right in these conversations with a confidence and certainty. There's a, there's a sense in Christianity that there needs to be a dogmatic certainty. And this pops up with many of the monotheistic religions and their spinoffs. And speaking as a former Christian, there was a huge focus on faith as a path to knowledge. And as I moved through different forms of Christianity, going from Southern Baptist to Episcopalian and finally to Celtic Christianity, I found the stress on certainty to be less and less important. But even still, as I was on my spiritual journey, which traversed into paganism and has so far led to heathenry, that little suitcase of latent Christianity kind of followed me, demanding that I be certain of my positions. And I felt the need to live up to that certainty, otherwise I was without knowledge. This shows how knowledge can be a bit of a, a weasel word, something that can shift in meaning through conversation. I don't think that a reasonable usage of the word knowledge references absolute certainty, but too often that's how it gets used in colloquial language. When someone says, I know this to be the case, they can mean with absolute certainty. And in the context of this conversation, some Christians are the biggest perpetrators of this, saying that they don't just believe in their God, they know, reinforcing that dogmatic certainty. I, I think this results in a, a reaction that uncertainty must be dogmatic as well. And this, it often seems to be an overcorrection from latent Christianity into the other direction, that if you don't know, or I think more accurately can't know in this sense, then you must therefore not hold the position or even believe the position, such that many atheists will often step back from even saying that they believe that the gods do not exist because they don't know either way. So they withhold belief because they lack knowledge, which is cart before the horse. Both of these attitudes seem to affect new polytheists almost equally, as if we're caught in between the two dogmas, disagreeing with both of them, but also kind of stuck in this position of not really having a choice as far as what we believe. So there's a present belief, but we're stuck as how to label it, stricken with latent Christianity, if not, you know, claiming this belief in the gods unless we know but also with the narrative that if we don't know, well, then we must not believe, in spite of the fact that, um, that we have the belief. I've learned that there's serious problems with both of these, and they're intertwined, but I want to explain something first. Something to understand in this conversation is that knowledge is a subset of belief. It goes underneath an umbrella of belief. If you withhold belief on things that you don't know with certainty, then you will know nothing and believe nothing. And think about it in this sense. 
If there is something that you know, it can be said that you believe it to be true. But there are times where you might suspect something strongly enough to believe it, even if you wouldn't say that you know it to be true. To say that you know something and do not believe it would be a contradiction. To believe something would be to essentially hold agreement to something. And to know something, you also have to hold agreement to it, at least on some level. But it does seem to be a higher level than that of belief. Even uncomfortable truths that we know to be the case are things that we can't really help but agree with, meaning that we believe them, even if we don't want to. At which point, it's impossible to come up with something that you might know, but that you don't believe. There's a, a fun but entirely unhelpful meme in the atheist community that is laden with a misunderstanding around this to try and play gotcha games with Christians. And that is to say that they do not believe in evolution, but they accept evolution in light of the evidence. But that means you believe it. To not believe it would be to imply that you do not agree with it. And if you're accepting it, then you must agree with it, which means you believe it. Hate it here. It's amazing how many little gotcha zingers there are like that, that only show upon closer examination that the person making the zinger doesn't understand the subject. Taking us back to the discussion of knowledge meaning absolute certainty, there's not really much of a way to really know very much in this unreasonable sense. We have base assertions rooted in our experience, but these could be wrong. And that goes for our physical experiences of the world around us, our spiritual experiences, and anything in between. The universe around us could be a mental projection, it could be purely physical, it could be something else entirely that we don't yet understand, and yet, it's fine to believe any of these things despite not having any degree of certainty around them beyond what we experience and how we interpret those experiences. There seems to be a collective understanding of similarity in experiences. And we share them with one another, we compare them, we find areas of agreement. Trees are green, concrete is rough to the touch. And this happens as well with religious experience and experience with the gods. And there's also differences. We might have differing political beliefs. We might see life completely differently depending on the varying perspectives of what we assume is the same reality. And we see the same with religious experiences and experiences with the gods. And yet, in both cases, though we might not know these things to be true with certainty, we still believe them. And that's usually fine. Now, is someone right? Probably. There's a few billion humans. At least someone's going to be onto something, right? Or maybe not. Maybe we're all wrong. But until we have some way of finding out, that's not necessarily the most important question. Have your experiences and perspectives led you to a belief in the gods? Then fine. Have they led you to disbelieve in them? Then fine. You should question yourself. You should find out why you hold these positions. But there's nothing irrational about a belief in the gods on its own, nor is there anything irrational about a disbelief in the gods on its own. Now, you can make it so by using an illogical argument or putting contradictory attributes onto the gods, but that's an entirely different conversation than the belief on its own. But at the end of the day, it's okay not to know, at least not in this sense of absolute certainty, because no one really does you can say that you know something is coherent. You can say that you know it's consistent with your experience. And from there, one can say that they know that the gods are coherent and consistent with their experience. And from there, you have a basic justification for belief. Where you go from there is up to you. Do you respond to this belief? Do you do anything about it? There's plenty of information to find, but I would say not to let the lack of certainty plague you while you explore. Uncertainty does not mean that something has to be dismissed. Otherwise, we would have to dismiss the universe around us. In fact, as someone who loves puzzles, especially impossible ones, <laughs> the kind of uncertainty offered by this question of the gods is one that I think deserves honest exploration. And actually, you know what? <laughs> We're going to do this. Let's talk about a fun little philosophy problem that often frustrates the living heck out of people, and that is the dreaded solipsism conversation and how it relates to all of this. There's, um, there's various forms of solipsism, but solipsism is simply the position that the only thing we can know for certain, we might be the wrong word here, but screw it, is that the mind exists. Everything else is sus. 
But one might object and say that they saw the sun rise over a tree. And they can chop down this tree, and they can count the rings in the tree, demonstrating the age of the tree. And that this tree has existed for a long time, even predates you, without our being there, making it not mind-dependent. And therefore, solipsism is false. Thank you, and good day. The solipsist would respond that this is all very nice, but it doesn't really prove anything. And in order to engage with this, we first have to have several presuppositions. Firstly, that the external world exists in the first place. The tree, the sun, the rings you counted, all of that is in the external world. And that's what's under question in the first place. And therefore, you are using sus things to say it's not sus, which is sus. There's also the fact that all of these observations were made through experience, which makes them sus. And all these experiences out there that might confirm these supposed facts are also simply experiences which makes them sus. And the fact that you're saying all these sus things means you're sus. So we're throwing you out of the airlock. Demonstrating that the external world exists to a solipsist by using things in the external world in order to demonstrate it is just circular argumentation, and it's not going to convince the solipsist who is sus of everything of which they cannot be absolutely certain. And they cannot be absolutely certain of the external world, so why are you using it to prove it? It's like saying to an atheist that the Bible is true because the Bible says so. You're using something that they already do not give credence to in order to convince them of something, and that's just not going to work. The external world is just an unfalsifiable claim with zero certainty, and believing in it is just believing an assumption which is not rational and good day. But, look... A lot of us actually do believe this assumption, which means we're all engaging with an unfalsifiable claim that we cannot be absolutely certain of. But it seems true in accordance with our experiences, so screw it, we'll explore. And in much the same way, a polytheist can say that through their experiences, there seems to be multiple gods. So we're going to roll with it provisionally in order to explore. So I'm not an atheist and for much the same reasons that I'm not a solipsist. I simply lack a belief that gods do not exist, as my experiences have suggested otherwise. The idea that the gods do exist is consistent with my experience. So I'm happy to explore. Let me know your thoughts. This is one of the positions that I hold that probably confuses the most people. I think that dogmatic uncertainty is something that is fairly common, and that people don't often realize that it's a dogmatism, and that it's even applied fairly specifically to God belief and not much else, at least not consistently. This dogmatic uncertainty is often loaded with Christian baggage, set on locking off a discussion and exploration, even experimentation. I didn't start exploring polytheism until I realized that it was an option, and I didn't make that realization until I met a polytheist. And sometimes people leaving Christianity don't realize that belief in the gods, or even spirituality, is still on the table, and that you can approach it differently than the forced dogmatic certainty that they'd experienced in the past. But with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. The subscribe button has accused the like button of not existing, and I can't convince it otherwise. Maybe if you hit the like button, the uh, subscribe button will hear the noise and become convinced. Or it'll become a solipsist, I don't know. But ring the bell if you want to be kept posted for more heathen content, and remember to find a way or make one. You're all fucking sus.